On this week's 51%, we speak with the editors of Fighting Mad, a new book of essays reimagining the abortion rights, or rather reproductive justice, movement. So abortion is not enough. That's the thing. You have to live in a place where you have access to health care. You have to live in a place where you have access to a livable wage. All of these things are what we call intersectionally involved in being able to make dignified and safe reproductive decisions. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on. I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jesse King. Today, we're bringing you some stories and interviews on reproductive justice. The Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade with Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization in 2022 has led to a patchwork of restrictions or protections on abortion, depending on your circumstances and the state you live in. As we'll hear from our main guest today, the post-Dobbs landscape has also forced advocates on both sides of the issue to shift their approach. Ricky Solinger is an independent historian whose work has largely focused on reproductive politics, while Crystal Littlejohn is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. In their new book, Fighting Mad, Resisting the End of Roe v. Wade, the pair include essays from on-the-ground abortion rights activists, clinic directors, healthcare professionals, lawyers, artists, and more. The book is certainly a call to action, and just a note that Solinger and Littlejohn represent one side of this long-debated and divisive issue. Salinger says her aim with the book is not just to rehash the abortion debate or the end of Roe v. Wade, but demonstrate how abortion rights activists are responding and adjusting their thinking after Dobbs. Salinger argues the future of the abortion rights movement should go beyond the argument of whether women should have the right to choose abortion. Rather, she says it demands a broad dedication to reproductive justice and an understanding that abortion access impacts all sectors of society. I was just, you know, sort of glancing through the book now that it's a material object in my hand. And I saw that Victoria Rodino, um, who is a labor organizer, said abortion rights is a labor issue. You can fill in the blank. You know, she said it was a labor issue because women have to go to work. And what are you going to do if pregnancy and abortion coverage aren't in your insurance plan or aren't in your contract. You know, this is a new domain. This gives us the opportunity to reimagine what the radical position is, what is really necessary, not what can we, what crumbs might we be able to get, but what can we really achieve here? And so, you know, yes, abortion rights is a labor issue. Abortion rights is an educational issue. Abortion rights is an environmental issue, a public health issue. I mean, you cannot look at, it's a privacy issue. It's actually abortion rights is everything. And I think building on the idea of abortion being an everything issue, you know, we have people writing about how it's an incarceration issue, right? Where even before Dobbs, uh, you had incarcerated pregnant people not being able to experience their right uh, to abortion and their right to reproductive freedom uh, when they were incarcerated. We have folks talking about the ways that in states that have uh, really limited access to abortion and limited the ways that people talk about abortion the opportunity that educators have to try and make their syllabi and other materials fit within the guidelines of the university, but still manage to provide much needed crucial information um, for people looking uh, for information about what's available to them. We have folks talking about access issues in in rural areas in Appalachia. Um, And so just really making the case that abortion is an everything issue, and especially being clear that abortion is an every one issue. Um, even if people think that it, it doesn't have to do with them, it, even if they may feel like they're not interested in abortion, there's so many essays in this volume that touch on so many different issues that make it clear that for anybody who cares about freedom and cares about democracy, they must also necessarily care about abortion. 
we were very interested in showing what people are doing. And in that, that sense, showing what post Dobbs activism looks like, in part because we've heard a lot, I've heard a lot, particularly from women my age, who say, but where are all the people in the streets? Don't people in Texas actually care about this? Where are they? And this book is such so illustrative of what activism looks like in the United States today, how it's everywhere, how it's in Oklahoma, how it's in Appalachia, how it's in California, how it's in Louisiana. And there's a second thing that I think that we were really um, moved to make clear, and that is, so what is reproductive justice anyway? And how is reproductive justice different from choice? which is what we've always talked about in this movement, or for many years at least. You know, the book really makes clear in so many different ways the insufficiency of choice, how that's a very individualistic, deracinated, out-of-community way of understanding what people need in order to have, as I said, dominion over their own bodies and to avoid the kind of degradation that goes without, with being forced to act in one way or another by the government. We need to see how people live in communities and only insofar as their communities can support them with the kinds of resources that they need to be able to manage their own lives and bodies, will they be able to access reproductive justice. So abortion is not enough. That's the thing. You have to live in a place where you have access to health care. You have to live in a place where you have access to a livable wage. How can people say they can make choices about reproduction if they can't support themselves? They can't find good food or non-toxic living environments. So all of these things are what we call intersectionally involved and in being able to make dignified and safe reproductive decisions. You know, when it comes to future legal battles over abortion rights, because this is far from going away or being settled anytime soon, do you see this broader push for reproductive justice shaping the narrative and arguments in the courts as well? I think it's complicated. I think one of the strengths of reproductive justice as a framework and a movement is that it recognizes the limits of the courts in giving people the legal access to the rights that are their human rights. Reproductive justice has stood as a beacon of hope for people um, fighting to secure rights that the courts have not only actively fought against, but oftentimes fought to prevent them from having. And so I don't know what's going to happen uh, as we move forward and, and the courts uh, try and, you know, or people in the courts continue to develop different frames. But I will say uh, that as much as I hope that reproductive justice takes root, I would be very cautious and I'd be interested in seeing how the courts decide to deploy the language. There can be a tendency to deploy a language and not actually aspire and commit to the tenets of, of the idea. And I think that with reproductive justice, if there's not a commitment from people in the courts to actually help people secure the right to reproductive justice, then they can claim that they're doing it all that they would they would like to. Uh, but what we need to see is, is true follow through. What we do know is that on the ground with activists and, and folks uh, committed to reproductive justice, we see that follow through. And so I'm going to continue to look to them for, for my hope um, and not, not depend on the courts to uh, grant people the rights that we know that they should have, um, but that people actively have, have had to fight for for centuries in this country. Well, on that note, the contributors in your book lay out that part of reproductive justice is recognizing how the lack of resources and access particularly impacts historically marginalized communities and sort of, you know, that need to make amends. Um, what do you mean by that? Tell me a little bit more on that front. We can't understand what kinds of reproductive rights and access exist in the United States without looking at everybody. And if we only look at white women, if we only look at middle class women, 
we're actually just reproducing the racism that exists and structures these matters in society. That's one of the things that we're um, very focused on in the Fighting Mad book is bringing to the center and bringing to the consciousness of the reader people who aren't as steeped in this business as we are to see what happens to their thinking about reproductive rights, what reproductive justice is, when you make that shift, when you don't put white women in the center and put other people in the center. One thing you lay out early on in the introduction, actually, is the idea that historically reproductive rights have been manipulated to restrict certain communities. You know, in the case of the U.S., you argue that, you know, reproductive rights have been used to promote a white population while holding back black and brown people. Um, could you expand on that for me a little bit? How do you see this playing out throughout history? Well, as the historian, I will say that all one has to do is look at the foundational um, interest among white settlers on a continent which was not occupied by other white people to create a society which was for the benefit of white people. And the way that was done was first off to import the bodies of African people to be enslaved and to work to make money for these white people who could then um, become the masters of society. In the process of their being white settlers and moving away from the edge of the continent, that brought them into contact with other people who they wanted to master and whose land they wanted to own. How do you ensure that you are in control of a growing continental dominion of land um, without making sure that as new generations are born, every child who is born is evaluated and valued according to his perceived, his or her perceived race. African-American reproduction was for the benefit of white people. Native births were yet more people who needed to be cleared off of land, and laws were created to ensure that. And up until today, I mean, you know, the, the legacy of, the, of racism in the United States is everywhere. And we're not really here to talk about Black maternal and infant mortality rates but um, one can trace these things back, trace all of the reproductive ills that structure the continuing racialization of reproduction in the United States. Absolutely. We know that for Black birthing people and other marginalized folks, the right to have an abortion is only one component of the right to reproductive justice, right? That historically they've been deprived and contemporarily are deprived of the right to have children when they want to have children. They're deprived of the right to raise their, their children in, in safe and healthy communities. And with Ricky's comment about uh, the black maternal uh, mortality crisis, right? Their the children are deprived of, of the right to be able to grow up with their mothers uh, because of, of the mortality crisis. I think when it comes to grappling with the importance of reproductive justice uh, for not only for everybody, but for marginalized folks in particular, which the the framework and movement was was started to uh, advocate for, it becomes especially important for us socially to make sure that when we're fighting for people's rights, that we're always being mindful of the ways that the most marginalized among us are negatively affected by the activities of governments, of communities, of politicians and practices. We keep that center of mind as we think about the intersecting structures, right? Racism, sexism, heterosexism, the you know ableism. There's so many different things that reproductive justice as a framework uh, really demands that we pay attention to, so that we can be mindful and act on uh, the different forces that prevent people from from accessing the right to reproductive justice. Well, thank you both for coming on. You know, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want potential readers to know? 
I, I just want to say one more thing about this is that some people might listen to our our present what we're saying to you and think, well, gee, if reproductive justice is everything, maybe it's nothing. You know, maybe it's so miasmic, so everything that I can't really get my arms about around it. But, you know, I have always found the one really um, useful way of understanding what reproductive justice is for everybody is to look at my own reproductive history and to be very clear about what I required in order to reproduce and to have children and for everything to be okay. I know that I needed medical care. I know that I needed people who were going to oversee my birthing, who I could trust. I know I had to learn things and know people who I could learn things from medically while I was pregnant. I know I needed to feel that I could send my children to a good daycare center where I could feel they were safe and moving, progressing along as little kids and good schools and a, and live in a nice house. I mean, and I'm not talking about riches. I'm talking talking about what I what I needed to be able to feel secure for myself and my children. That's what reproductive justice is. Ricky Solinger and Crystal Littlejohn are the editors behind the new book of essays, Fighting Mad, Resisting the End of Roe v. Wade, and how abortion rights activists are shifting their view of reproductive justice after the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade in 2022. It's out now through the University of California Press. Ricky and Crystal, thanks again. We appreciate you, too. Thank you. Now the latest on a story we've covered a couple times on this show. Expecting mothers, nurses, and other stakeholders are still waiting to learn the fate of Burdett Birth Center in Troy, New York. The healthcare system that runs maternity ward, St. Peter's Health Partners, announced plans to close Burdett in as little as six months last year. Those plans received widespread criticism and were ultimately delayed until at least this June. As WAMC Samantha Simmons reports, residents and advocates recently rallied against the closure in a meeting with healthcare officials. What you're seeing here is what happens uh, when a community cares so deeply about something that they just don't stop. And I find it really shameful that it took you nine months to face us in person. Hundreds of people gathered at Hudson Valley Community College for a public forum with officials from St. Peter's Health Partners to discuss their concerns over the proposed closure of Burdett Birth Center on June 30th. St. Peter's Health Partners has cited an operating loss in staffing concerns in its decision to close the center. It differs from traditional labor and delivery units by approaching low-risk births collaboratively with patients, midwives, and obstetricians. Supporters warn it would leave no birth centers in Rensselaer County, meaning patients would have to drive up to an hour to access the same care elsewhere. Many echoed similar concerns regarding access, quality of care, high C-section rates at other providers, and the impacts of consolidation. Ashley Saup is an organizer with the Save Burdett Birth Center. This targets the most vulnerable amongst us. For nearly three hours, St. Peter's executives fielded questions from opponents of the plan. You have to remember, we are a not-for-profit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And you're all nodding, right? Local officials you know joined the means. chorus, saying they do not fault the hospital's our local leadership. Rensselaer County Executive Steve McLaughlin, a Republican, Claim St. Peter's is taking orders from a corporation, Trinity Health, that doesn't understand the community. They came out of the blocks uh, with their minds made up. They were less than forthcoming every single step of the way with information. And the information we did get was uh, not accurate many times. It was flat out um, uh, wrong many times, and it was deceptive many times. So uh, I'm not at all happy. And that, that isn't to say that there's not good people at St. Peter's Healthcare. There is. There's a lot of great people locally that work there. St. Peter's president and CEO, Dr. Stephen Hanks, says the forum further shined a light on the community's concerns, and the executive board plans to take the feedback into consideration. We're always going to have internal conversation. Um, if, if we weren't willing to do that, we wouldn't have had this forum, right? So we're listening. Um, we are going to have some, some more conversation within our team. We're hearing the commitment that the community has to the Burdett Birth Center. We have to marry that with our reality. 
of how are we going to, you know, continue to put ourselves on a sustainable path to be able to preserve a broad array of services. Nurses from across the region took the floor to discuss the impact a closure could have on neighboring health care facilities. Dawn Zip, a NICU nurse at Bellevue Women's Hospital in Schenectady, says closing the Rensselaer County facility would leave several counties at a loss and further strain others. When you say you're not going to do something, about five years later it comes down with a gavel. So I'm just... We are aware of the way management works within St. Peter's and Trinity Healthcare System. Um, I am going to say this. Um, I am kind of appalled at some of the statements here. We all know that you are level three, and there is a specialty that you guys bring to the table that the lower levels need. And now when you close a facility with a lower level, you are now going to inundate your patient population and take beds away from patients that require that level of care. Hank says the proposed closure was not a sudden decision. Hank says when Burdett was created and funded to be a freestanding entity in 2011, the Department of Health warned of declining birth rates and would only issue the facility a five-year operating license, which was then renewed for three years in 2016. Then, when the pandemic hit, the facility was being funded through Crucial Cares Act funding. Kenneth Baker, St. Peter's Chief of Obstetrics and Gynecology, says the transition plan preserves prenatal care in Troy, and even after the closure of Burdett, the Samaritan Hospital emergency room will remain open to mothers in labor. Baker says the closure of the birth center would not only reduce the hospital's cost, but improve its continuum of care. I've been meeting with the midwives regularly since we made the decision to transition the Burdett Birth Center over to St. Peter's, and we are working with them collaboratively to bring everything they do at Burdett to our location on Manning Boulevard. Republican Troy Mayor Carmela Mantello says she fears for the future of other health care facilities in the city. There really has been no effort to try to put money in the budget, to avoid this closure. Um, this just is not acceptable. And as, you know, the chief elected of the city of Troy, um, you know, my other fear is that it doesn't end with her dad. On the same day as the hearing, St. Peter sued State Attorney General Tish James to halt a probe of the closure. The State Department of Health still needs to give final approval for the closure. The Attorney General's office did not respond to a request for comment. For health care overall, but we've found ways to move care into lower cost settings. Samantha Simmons, WAMC which, News, over the long Troy. Haul, makes things more One last story before we go. For Women's History Month, we're setting aside time each week to learn about some notable women in American history. And a new exhibit at Vassar College sheds light on the life and career of American photographer Rolly McKenna. Rosalie Rolly McKenna is best known for her work as an architectural and portrait photographer who documented the modernization of New York City and some of the most popular literary minds of the mid-20th century. A 1940 graduate of the private college in Poughkeepsie, New York, McKenna also took extensive pictures of the campus's historic buildings. Mary Kay Lambino and Jessica Breyer are the curators behind the new exhibit at the Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center called Making a Life in Photography. They believe it's McKenna's first career-spanning exhibition, which is surprising because Breyer says McKenna is the most represented individual photographer in the Loeb's collection. That really, I think, sent us down the rabbit hole of finding out who this person was and realizing that she had this unbelievably rich and interesting career, extremely prolific, and a huge archive that was basically untouched. McKenna, who died at age 84 in 2003, carved out a career as a freelance photographer at a time when women of her class were still largely expected to get married and stay at home. In addition to Vassar, McKenna boasted a long list of clients that included Vogue, Vanity Fair, Fortune, and New York's Museum of Modern Art. While she did marry earlier in her career, the extremely short-lived union primarily benefited McKenna by giving her an alias. She would still occasionally go by Mrs. McKenna to lend herself a certain legitimacy with customers who might have refrained from hiring a single queer woman. Lambino says McKenna launched her business by taking photos for Vassar professor Richard Krautheimer, who needed pictures for his architecture students to reference. It's interesting to think that he had kind of asked her to make a certain kind of photograph, and then she takes that on as her style, and then continues to use those photographs to begin her career. You can see it in two different ways. 
so was Richard Krautheimer kind of using this young person's talent, or was she, in a way, sort of using his um, influence and his cachet in the world um, to get her work out there? And I would say both. McKenna's style was straightforward. After all, her work was literally meant to be studied. But that doesn't mean it was easy. For example, while another photographer might walk up to the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence and capture its iconic dome from the ground up, McKenna scaled the cathedral complex until she found the perfect floor and angle to depict the dome head-on and up close. Her portraits shared a similar honesty. Lombino says McKenna found family and a network of friends that included Vassar alum Elizabeth Bishop, fellow photographer Laura Gilpin, and famous poets like Anne Sexton and Dylan Thomas. She profiled each of them, and instead of posing her subjects in a manipulated studio, she followed them into their spaces and pulled from a list of tricks to help them get comfortable. Someone described her as fiddling with her camera as though she didn't know how to work it, and then the person who was being photographed would get a little concerned and try to almost like help her with this issue, and then she would realize, oh, they're not posing anymore, and that's when she would capture their photograph. And so you'll see them um, sometimes in much more relaxed states. McKenna's portrait series of Thomas, captured shortly before his death in 1953, would become one of her most well-known works. She also contributed to MoMA's first photography showcase of Latin American architecture in 1955 and photographed Helen Keller alongside her interpreter and companion Polly Thompson in 1958. Breyer suspects McKenna's time with Keller and Thompson, and with couples like Elizabeth Bishop and Lota de Macedo Suarez, was transformational. She saw how two women could live together and support one another. A few years later, McKenna met her longtime partner, Patricia Wilson, and moved to Stonington, Connecticut, where the pair tore down the fence between their neighboring houses and raised three of Wilson's four children. Despite an extensive resume, Breyer says McKenna received little recognition for her work. Her photographs were often copied and printed without credit, and even when she contributed to a large exhibition, like the MoMA showcase, the subjects were the star of the show. However, Lombino says McKenna preserved her own legacy. In addition to keeping extensive records and copies of her work, McKenna published an autobiography called A Life in Photography in 1991. Breyer and Lombino say they drew heavily from the book for the exhibit. We read every single one of her diaries that she kept, and she kept diaries for years. She knew that, yeah, no one else was gonna do this work. She was a woman who made a career in the 1950s. Nobody else was gonna do that for her. And so she made sure that it was gonna happen, and she made sure that a project like this could happen after her lifetime, which is an incredible thing. Making a life in photography, Rolly McKenna runs through June 2nd. Thanks for listening to this week's 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at wamcpodcasts.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can stay in the loop on all of WAMC's shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at wamc.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl, I was nobody else, I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half, he was a hollow laugh. And I lost my cool somewhere along the way. At night and on the hallway, I had to learn how to look away. Lost my cool, no electricity, hot rain on the concrete, sweet bells in little girl dreams. They said, oh, I want a big life, not a house that could have been like, where are you taking me? Where are you taking me? They said, everything I do, I feel farther.